behavior change. And we've just recently also changed from human, human behavior change for animals to human behavior change for life because we're doing more and more work in conservation and in animal nature connectedness and things like that. Um, so I founded HPCL with my colleague Joe. Um, and why? Well, because if we understand why humans do the things they do and what drives us to change, we'll be more effective at making the world a better place for people, animals, and our planet. So just really briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about human behaviour change. Some of you will have seen some tiny bits, but it is a new talk. Um, we are talking about understand change impact as a kind of a model or framework for change. And all the way through, lots of tips, tools, and discussion. Because what I really want you to leave you with um, today and at the end of this session is some tools and tips for how to talk to your clients and other people you come into contact with, um, but also some kind of frameworks and tools for you. Um, looking on your own behaviour and your own outreach activities. So maybe you've seen this before, but it's really illustrates a couple of points. It's just there's all this pressure, you know, and sometimes it feels like it's right up on me, and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop things, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't. So, um, what do you think of like, why I played that? <laughs> any any thoughts about what what we might help? Oh, they're walking up into me. That's going to be an unrelated slide. Let's let's go to the answer. <laughs> um, so the thing about this um, is that it tells us that providing knowledge is not usually enough, and yet so many of us leap into telling people facts and try to say, if only they knew this, and then they'd change their behavior. Well, we know from ourselves that's often not enough. So we need to start thinking about that when we're having our conversations with people. And try not to jump in with a solution. It also shows us that empathetic approaches work. You saw how to change when you started to be a bit more empathetic, and we know that. So that's tip number one, is try to get away from relying on knowledge provision, from explaining things and telling people things. That will be an important part of our work, but it's not necessarily going to go all the way to creating behaviour change with people in our conversations. Right, the second one, I've got some questions for you. So if you jot down or think in your head the answer, um, if you agree with the, or disagree with the following statements. So the first one, world hunger is a serious problem that needs attention. Jot down, yes. The second one, our country needs to address the growing number of homeless people. The third one, the clothing industry is responsible for pollution, overproduction, terrible working conditions, etc. And the last one, the dog media occasionally publish something really good amidst a lot of misinformation. So now, bearing those answers in mind, answer the following questions. Do you personally do anything to lessen world hunger? Do you, do you donate to people? Do you write to your MP? Do you personally do anything to help the homeless? Volunteer, donate. Do you buy clothes from mainstream sellers? And do you provide positive and negative feedback to um, the dog media industry? So hopefully that's kind of obvious where that's leading. It's so easy to have really strong opinions and to believe really strongly in something, to have the attitude there and the awareness there, 
and still not act in accordance with those behaviours. It's so easy for us to feel really strongly about things and not go all the way through and do them. And again, so this is what we need to bear in mind when we're talking to people, because many people will end up, you'll end up bringing them on side. They will think, they will start to agree with you about if, your dog, if their dog's struggling and that kind of thing. But there's still a big gap between necessarily them believing it and then changing their behaviour accordingly. And we need to bear that in mind. We need to start having these things in our head about how do we go that step further to really make sure things change. So tip two is we need to bear in mind that we don't act congruently for our perceptions, attitudes, behaviours, uh, beliefs, intentions and behaviours. We need to bear in mind that people won't do that and we need to help them with every trick in the book. So I just want you to think about a point of time when someone's trying to change your behaviour. So what are they trying to make you do? Like for me, people always see the time I, I send emails and they're like, what are you doing up at two o'clock in the morning? You need to go to bed earlier. And I'm like, but my brain kicks in about there <laughs> and I don't want to go to bed earlier. And that's fine with me. Um, so what are the things that people try to make you change? Have a think. And then thinking about how that makes you feel. Do you feel, I get annoyed. I'm like, well, what do you know about my life? I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> I like being a vampire. So, um, and, and just, I think sometimes it's helpful to reflect on our own behaviour because we often try to change other people and we're often telling them what to do or giving suggestions. And we need to think about what it makes, how it makes us feel when people try to tell us things and even however helpful they are and however well-meaning. So I think it's always really worth reflecting on some of this stuff because we're out there trying to get people to always think about how people, how you feel when people are telling you things. So when you think, oh, I've got a new way of explaining to people, or this is how I work with that client, um, try to sort of double check in with yourself. If they were telling you, explaining this to me that way, how would I take it and how would I feel? That links to some of the things the other speakers have said as well. So next, this is one I always have to include, just because um, I always talk about human behaviour change and people often think it's just about education or just about something, but it's about all these things, there's so much we can learn from. There's like things like management theory, sociology, psychology, anthropology, all theologies, behavioural economics, um, and so much more. And so that's what us at HPCL, we try to learn from all these fields and put them together. And we have this kind of model um, that works whether it's a status of a project, a campaign, a programme, or just a conversation. And so often I think of things like if you have a framework in your head, about how to structure things, it can help a little bit. And we tend to use this structure. First of all, really trying to make sure we understand the situation. So asking lots of questions, making sure we're not jumping to assumptions. And then the change bit, so looking at how we can make the change. Um, and then impact, so how, what's the result of it. Um, and through this process, the reason why there's lots of circles is because they all feed into each other. So we keep feeding back and checking our understanding and seeing if what we're doing works and revisiting it. And the bit on the bottom, monitoring and research and development, is just also to show that all the way through we're always checking in. So first of all, we're gonna look a little bit about understanding things. And a good way of understanding things is doing using systems thinking. So everything's a system, whether it's the human bodies made up of circulatory systems, immune systems, breathing systems, you forget <laughs> all my words, um, neurological systems, and they all work together to make it work as a body. And that's the same with most things. There's lots of things. When we pull on one bit, we change other things. And we need to really break down and understand all the different elements of the thing we're trying to change. So this is an example, sort of a mind map of um, strategies for whole food or plant-based living. Well, I love this because it includes some you know, barriers that people might not have thought about instantly. So the one, the green one down there, chopping. You know, some people are like, well, a barrier is it hasn't got a really good knife, and so it takes ages to chop all the vegetables. Um, you know, so we've got things like that. I mean, we can really, look, the more and more we break things down and look at things from all conceivable angles, we can find lots of problems. And then the brilliant thing about finding problems is that each one can be flipped into a solution or something to do about it. And so whenever we're looking at problems, so that might be, you might map your own life, and we'll do some of this in a minute, 
You might have something like in the middle, it might be that you want to have a bigger impact or outreach, or it might be you start looking at a conversation and how you might frame that conversation. Especially if you're going into a tricky conversation or one you're not sure about, you can do a mind map of it and say, what could happen? This might happen and that might happen. And we can get, you know, start exploring it. And so to be, it's really important to develop our questioning skills. So the parable of the elephant is that there's five men, blind men, important fact, um, standing around an elephant, and they're all asked to describe the animal in front of them. So the guy by the trunk says this animal's like a snake, the guy by the legs says the animal's like a tree, the guy by the tail says this animal's like a squishy, annoying thing, and so on. They're all using the information they have in front of them to form an opinion about that animal. And they're all right in their own way, but they're not seeing the whole picture. And this is just a really, really um, implore, uh, imploration? <laughs> I implore you um, to always <laughs> test your assumptions and to think, am I seeing the whole picture here? Am I jumping to assumptions? Am I jumping to conclusions? Do I want it to be the same, similar to a case I saw last week because that would be easy and I put all the handouts all done? You know, it's a, we always need to question, question, question and think of the elephant. Are you seeing the whole elephant or are you just seeing the part that's in front of you? And having a curious mind is a recognised anthropological approach. You can put some science in it if you want to and there's fascinating stuff around this area. So exploring this a bit more, because we're still in the understand phase, we're going to look about how we do that. How can we truly understand and not jump to our own conclusions? And one of the techniques is called motivational interviewing, um, and one of the techniques in that um, field is ORS, which stands for these things in boxes. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening and summarising. So this can change the way you run a conversation. And when I first learned about this, I literally tried it out on a taxi driver after that conference. And it's amazing. I suddenly learned he was like this refugee who'd been in a band and then he'd been famous in France. And he was like, and he said he'd never talked to me, anyone, there's people in a taxi about any of those things. And it's just because I asked more questions and let him talk. And I found out this amazing wealth of information. And so that's what we can do when we're talking to people as well. And so open ended questions can anyone? be brave enough to chuck some things at me. What kind of questions could we ask? Or what kind of things could, might they start with those open-ended questions? Yeah. yeah, so how do you feel about this? Or how do you react when that happens? That's a really good one, a how, a how kind of beginning of a sentence. What else? Tell, tell me something about Yeah, them. so tell me about, or please describe, or um, things like that. There's also that those, it's not a yes or no question, it explores things. Or let's explore, or could you clarify that, or give me more information about. Those things are all really key, and we need to be using as many of those as possible. Um, we're going to zoom through this. <laughs> so some of these things you might need to come back to later. Affirmations. So this is like a magic tool. So if you're like me, a quite not confrontational person, but you want to you're in a conversation with an owner who's maybe doing some really terrible things that really you don't agree with. Well, affirmations enable you to kind of develop that trust with them, but not in a way that condones things. So you could say, so it's not praise, it's not saying, well done, <laughs> here's a treat. Although Skittles are always good. It's more about <laughs> saying, um, that's really interesting. You start, you've tried a lot of things. So if someone's just said all the terrible things they've been trying, you don't want to say, oh my god, that's terrible, quite yet, because you need to <laughs> take on a journey. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to say, brilliant, well done. And so things like saying, you've obviously tried a lot of things, you're really trying, you've gone to a lot of different people for help, um, things like that can be really nice, gentle ways of acknowledging what they're telling you, but not necessarily agreeing with it. Um, anyone else got any other types of affirmations you can think of? I like the way that you, and be specific. Yeah, exactly. I love the way that you talk about your dog. Or I like the way that you've explained to me that you've come and you're looking for another source of information, something like that. Brilliant. So the next one, I'll whistle stop tour of this. Um, reflective listening. So this is how you're reacting. So this is where we can reflect back things at people. So it's like packaging things back to them in a kind of tidier way than maybe <laughs> they've, they've explained it to you. 
So we can say things like, um, uh, does anyone have a example actually? <laughs> so I want to have a quick drink. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is um, that well, what I'm getting from you is that you uh, love your dog so much that you find it really frustrating when he eats all your TV controls, that kind of thing. Um, and that can help, again, help build rapport, help them feel listened to. And this is also important because this is going to set you up for um, not having to struggle with some kind of react feedback and defensiveness. And summarising things is linked to this. So summarising, you give it back to them. So for more conversation, I've heard that you're, this is brilliant, this is happening, but you're frustrated about that, and you come here and we're going to solve it together. And so all these things help build empathy as well, show that you're empathetic, and we know that an empathetic communication approach is a big success of behaviour change. So another tool. <laughs> this is a whistle-stop tool. A tool we're still in the understand phase. What else can we understand? We need to understand where someone is in their understanding of the situation. So this model shows that you go from pre-contemplation, where something really isn't on your radar, you've never thought that your dog might be fearful of the thing that you've got the problem with. And then contemplation, they're starting to think about it. Um, preparation, they might be Googling, always <laughs> a bit dangerous, um, but they're Googling for information, uh, preparing for making an appointment with someone. Action, they've made the appointment, they're doing something towards the change, and maintenance, that change is going on. And so if we ask our questions, we'll have a feel for where they are in this cycle, and then we can make sure that what our approach takes is that it meets that need. Because what we don't want to be doing is going into the wrong place. So if we go in loads of actions, hey, you can do this and this, and you can do this, but they're at the pre-contemplation stage, there's a mismatch of their needs and yours. You're going to need to take it further back and work on some of the understanding and some of that knowledge provision, perhaps. And the same the other way. If they're really up for it and they want action, but you're still explaining all the things, um, there's going to be a mismatch, and you're not going to get that really close uh, you know, rapport and the link you need with them. And so this is why to understand the situation, understand where they are, can help you change your communication accordingly. Um, and this can also be borne in mind with some of your outreach. So things like the way you talk to your own network might be different to the way you write an article for a general magazine, because there'll be a different <coughs> point, as it were. So we can bear this in mind for all sorts of things. Um, we have to bear in mind also that there's an emotional element that goes with this as well. So we're not going to go into this more detail, but there's an emotional roller coaster, and this is where you start maybe people become defensive or worried and so on. And it's important we recognise there's that emotional element. So another tip is to problem treat everything. So I love the tool of the problem tree because it has a really nice framework of changing problems to solutions. We're going to do one now. So, for example, the problem could be anything. It could be a dog that's eating everything it shouldn't, that he or she shouldn't be, and so on. But we'll start with a kind of a human one. So we're going to say perhaps the problem is that you're maybe frustrated that your impact in the world or with your clients is a bit slower than you'd like, for example. So first of all, we think of loads of causes. So causes might be, you know, you're not getting as big a readership as your blog as you wanted, or you're not working closely enough, although after today and all the top tips are going to be so networked. <laughs> um, uh, or you're losing clients to people advocating other methods. And we need to think of loads of causes and causes of causes so we really go down to the root. So we say, why am I not having enough close enough relationships with vets? Or maybe because I don't know any, maybe because um, they are questioning things, maybe because there's other people in your area and so on. So we really drill down like a toddler, but why, but why, but why? And so we get loads of causes because the more problems we've got, the more solutions when we come to flipping them. And then we look at the effects. Effects. Um, so the effects of having a small reach of a good blog is that your message is restricted to the same audience and so on. And the effect of not having enough relation, close enough relationships with vets might be that you're not getting as many active referrals as you want and so on. And so, and again, and then, the, and then what, and then what, and then what. So if your message is restrictive, you're not reaching as many people, 
so you're still in the same echo chamber, and so on and so on. And so it's awesome. And then lunchtime, I'm going to have a lunchtime activity that is sort of working on any of the things we cover in this talk in a bit more detail. So maybe some of you draw a tree, might have a problem in the middle, have loads of causes and effects and map it out a little bit and see how this works for you. Because what we do the next graph tree is you flip it. So you change your problem, the opposite is what your goal is going to be. So that could be that your personal impact is fulfilling, everything's amazing. And then you flip all the causes to the outcomes. So you have an increasing readership of your blog, close productive relationships, and you're retaining clients and so on. And then you flip the um, effects to impact. So that means you're getting the good messages out there, you're getting active referrals, um, and our methods of training are decreasing. And so the more, honestly, you need like loads and loads of groups and loads of branches, but this provides you so many solutions because every single barrier, you've flipped it into a possible solution. And this will give you loads to work with. And from that, you can change the act outcomes to activities and think about what you need to do to get there. So then you have your list of like your to-do list. Um, and you can change your impacts, uh, think about that a bit more. How am I going to know that this is working? So we love problem trees. It's a really good tool. You can use it for anything in the middle. You can have it to do with your own effectiveness or um, that you are nervous about having complicated conversations, perhaps. Anything can go in that middle bit. It's a really useful tool to explore things. Um, so next, we've now we've, like, started to explore things to really, really, really understand it. So now we're in a position to think about change. One, another tool, we're going to do more tools, is to think backwards from your goal. So let's think about your goal. Um, let's have, in relation to this conference, that you're super connected. So the goal is to be connected to everyone and have a really big network. So what do you need just before you're connected? Struggles things out. Just before that goal happens, what might be in place? Confidence. Yes, really good. Confidence and trust, those kind of things. What else? Support. Opportunity. Yeah, perfect. Support. Support, yeah, brilliant. And then we take it further and say, what do you have to have in place for those things to be in place? So before we can be, have the confidence <coughs> and trust, we have to have had lots of positive experiences and we have to have um, you know, kind of evidence, evidence for what's going on. And then we go back again and say, what do we have to have before that? What do you have to have behind what's the stage before the evidence? And you look back and you say, well, I might, might need more CPD, I might need to actually go and knock on some doors, <laughs> I might need to do things um, that come out of this conference. And so by going backwards, we can have often, it's a more often useful way of mapping what changes you really want to happen. So this is a really super useful tool. So after this conference, it'd be amazing if you took each kind of each person's talk and did put it through a theory of change and worked backwards to see how to get there. And so I'm trying to give you some tools to make the impact of this conference last a really long time. So now thinking about change and conversations with change. So we're going to have another little game. So what's my rule? If I say a sequence of numbers, two, four, eight. So can someone suggest um, some more along the well, it might follow that pattern? Yeah, so that so that follows my uh, follows the pattern, um, but it doesn't follow my rule. So it isn't my rule. What's next? Three five seven. Oh, so I, I don't know if everyone heard that because there's a few things that hard time. <laughs> so I went very well. So if someone was suggesting um, that you the numbers were two four eight, and then she doubled it to sixteen, and doubled it to thirty two, and they said you're doubling it. And so, yes, that follows the pattern, but that's not my rule, because you're trying to get to my rule. So, some, um, some, someone say another set of numbers. Everyone's just going now. Because <laughs> 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 you're peaked when you answer it. So, it should be 248. Right? Yeah, it should be 248. 14. Uh -huh. That's two. So, and what, so what are you doing? What, you, what rule are you using? I'm doing two and four to get eight. So that's, that's, um, <laughs> that's following my pattern, but your method of getting there isn't my rule. <laughs> One more, another suggestion of what it could be. It's 248. Are they ages of somebody? Say again? Are they ages of somebody? Ah, um, 
that's not following my pattern or my rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll figure out the industry. So this is just to show that most people, and you can ask this more and more and more, um, is that they continue to double things or to suggest numbers that they think will work. But what we really should be doing is suggesting things that you don't think will work, and so you can test out if your rule is my rule, um, like that critical thinking element. And so you can say, well, what about 1, 20, 2? <laughs> and then to, to work out if their rule is working, they're trying to work out my rule. And the lesson from this slightly strange exercise, because you can all hear each other very well, um, is that it highlights confirmation bias. And so we often, we, find, we hear what we're, we're, we want the rule to be, we suggest things that go in with that rule. So we start, we're saying, what the rule is this? I'm going to suggest things that work with my idea of the rule. And then it doesn't work. You think, I'll suggest some more that go in my idea of another rule. And you tell the rule. And what we're doing all the time is using the information that we have and trying to make other things fit to it. And that's what we do all the time. That's what our people, our clients will be doing, is they will be taking on information but trying to make it fit with their own preconception of what it should be. And this is super dangerous because um, if we then if we, if we fit with what they say, that's great, we're all, we're all aligned. But if we're not fitting with what they're doing, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to take on board what you have to say. So how to kind of avoid falling into their bins, as it were? <laughs> so if you have the picture on the that on over there, um, we've got facts, figures, and new information, and our beliefs, and we take on in the middle, and the rest of it kind of doesn't get taken on. Um, and that's what might happen with our clients. They might just not take things on that we say. So how can we avoid that? Well, it's a values-based communication can help to address this gap. So we can focus on the middle bit. So we can ask lots of questions to highlight where we're both having the shared values, and then we can use that as the kind of base. So then they'll hear that you're having the shared value as them, and then they're more likely to take on information because it fits with that rule. So you're kind of using it to your own um, benefit. Not your own benefit, and the dog and the people and everything will <laughs> work. Um, so this is a really key thing, I and mean, it'll take a little bit of exploring. And, um, so feel free to look at all the slides later as well. And positive messages generally tend to work better than negative messages for a whole heap of reasons. Okay, another tip: Can you use prompts or hooks? So often we try to provide people with little ideas of what they can do to remember to do something, but they're only going to work if they're easy for the person to do and they're highly motivated. So you can see prompts work in that bit when ability that's easy and people are motivated, then prompts are going to work. So then things like remembering leaving things by the door or um, you know, physiotherapists often use the example of if they want you to do the exercises and then if you, every, they say every time you go to the loo, do your little toe wiggles because they know that you're going to do a certain number of times a day, so you can hook that behaviour onto the toilet behaviour, and then that's more likely to be taken on. Well, that works when things are easy and when the motivation is high. But if things aren't easy and the motivation is low, and then it's not so useful to have all those kind of helpful thoughts, because we know from this model um, that it's not going to work. So that's just uh, another top tip, is be re think really carefully when you find yourself giving ideas that involve prompts or hooks. You need to have, it needs to be easy and motivation needs to be in place before we suggest those things. Next. Creating and sustained habits. So, so much of what people, how people train their dogs and how we manage dogs is food is habitual. So, so much is, you know, every day um, we do the same things. So we can use this to our, to the powers of good as well. And an example of creating good habits is to create what's called a habit statement. So you say, when I do this, I will do that, so that that happens. So an example, if I'm trying to get healthier by drinking more water, when I enter the kitchen, I'll have at least one handful of water, so that I'll get closer to the recommended healthy water intake every day. So we can use this for our dog owners as well. We can ask them to come up with their own habit statement. And it's so much stronger if they come up with their own than if you try to come up with it. Um, and try it, try it on yourself first. Have a, 
when I, I will say that statement. Good practical top tip. Next one, the whistle stop talk tips. I think it's twelve. So maybe now. <laughs> truly involved people. So this is the, again the saying: Tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me, and I truly understand. Is that we need to think about how we're about to do something, and then say, could I do that in the same way but involve people more? So can I ask them to test it? Can I help them do it? And every single time we are about to tell them something, think about how you can change that into an involvement. Um, obviously things like teeth cleaning is a really key one, so people often say, oh wait, just do it like this. Um, just go and clean your teeth, go and clean your dog's teeth. And then that's easier said than done for many dogs. Even showing them is easier said than done by many dogs. We need to be there just watching them and coaching them through the first time they clean their dog's teeth and give a tablet or have to put a bandage on. And we can help practice all those things, ideally in a preventative way, not just when you do it. And so just... Uh, Another thing to implore you to do is always think, how can I involve people more, not just tell them? Because this is linked to the principle of self-efficacy, so we're more likely to be to repeat what we're good at. So, and so help them master as many things as possible. Because you want them to repeat it and you feel confident. So what we often hear about is people being really worried about tricky conversations, and this is where we're going next for the last few minutes. Um, so sometimes it can be tricky, sometimes clients aren't as on board as we'd like them to be or you're having quite awkward conversations. Um, how can we not only not hate doing this but really embrace the thought of you know, actively going into some tricky conversations in the first place? So first of all, using some of the principles today, it's like an inoculation, it prevents tricky situations in the first place. Because if you've built that empathy, you've asked loads of questions, you've involved them, you're less likely to get defensiveness and almost aggression, aren't you? You're less likely to have all those things in the first place. So that's good, win-win. Um, and again, there's a very strong message in this talk, in this whole day, is the importance of community and peer support. So that's also really, really important. Bring on other people, help them create a uh, supportive community, build one with your other clients, and I think we've talk, touched on that already, but have your clients to share it so, so you know that they've all got some shared, uh, shared view and some shared teachings, um, and so that they can support each other. And that's super important because then they're going to be, your, but the community will reinforce those messages rather than going against them. Um, shape the positive, so we do that with animals obviously, but with people as well. Um, those affirmations, again, we talked about <coughs> earlier, those, um, it's really lovely to see how much you care for your dog, and all those sorts of con uh, sayings really shape <coughs> things and build them. An interesting one again for me, am I literature, is the model of ask, offer, ask. So this is when you're sort of an offer sandwich. <laughs> so you're not just going in with information, but first of all, you're saying, that's really interesting, so from everything you've explained today, <coughs> you've explained to me today, would you feel comfortable if I offered you some solutions and we now move on to uh, you know, exploring how we can change this? And then give them some examples um, and then ask them, say, so what do you feel about what you've just heard? Do you feel that that would work for you? And so having that kind of very gentle ask or for us can lead to a really positive communication, a really positive conversation or dialogue um, rather than just kind of going in. So the offer sandwich, or ask, offer, ask, is a really valuable framework. It also works quite well with husbands and children <laughs> and, um, and animals, of course. And having that um, overarching belief that everyone is okay, everyone is, everyone is worthy, everyone is respectful, is respected, everyone gets to where they are because of their life experiences, and we're okay with that. We're okay with all sorts of people, whatever their beliefs, and you're okay in your own skin and you're okay with them, and coming at conversations in that way um, helps things be a little bit more zen rather than if we're looking for the differences. We look for those similarities, those human similarities, and have a mutual respect underlying everything we do. And then again, it's like another inoculation to tricky conversations in the first place. Also being aware of some human behaviour, so defensiveness, 
um, not only predicts a lack of behaviour change, but also it sort of corrodes it sort of trust and rapport and things you've built in. And so, but it's also not about use. If someone being defensive, maybe they're on that um, roller coaster we saw earlier of emotional change. Maybe they need some further exploration. Maybe they don't sound heard and you need to ask some more questions. <coughs> so kind of use that as information rather than as a feeling of, oh my God, they hate me, they're never going to do anything, I don't want to get out of here. Try to change it into, well, how can I, how can I ask this? How can I ask them how they're feeling, what they're going to do about it? And sort of use it as information and not as a feeling of like, oh my God, <laughs> let, uh, let me escape. Um, which I talk into lots of behaviours and things. Um, sadly, that's how many people feel in some conversations. They're just sort of looking to be set free um, if it's not going very well. But if we can change that around and think of that as how can I use that information to think of this conversation in a different way, it's very empowering. You get a bit more zen and a bit less pain and the behaviour is getting out of it. So now we're on to impact. So this is a question of, I tend to use at the end of um, com conversations and talks, is on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to put into action everything we've discussed today? And so if they say, so go on, give me some numbers. <laughs> seven. Seven, brilliant. So you're a seven, that's great. So why not a five? Because uh, I hope that I could do seven. <laughs> <laughs> And whereas I think if I was a two, then I think, oh well, perhaps you know, really haven't really understood anything. I'm not going to have the time to reconsider anything. Brilliant. So what can we do to what can we do to support you to make you more likely to do it? Is there anything you need from me? Um, maybe when you've had a chance to think about it, we can come back and talk again. So this is a really nice, like, non-confrontational tool to find out how they're feeling at the end of a discussion because you're not. Um, saying, sort of taking it for granted that they are going to put everything into place, into action, but also you're not, sometimes you're thinking, well, they don't like it, they're not going to do it, and you might be pleasantly surprised because they'll say they are going to do everything. But also, it also puts the responsibility on them a bit more, because if they've admitted to themselves and they've voiced it and they've explained to you that they might not do everything, or that they're only going to take on some things on board, and then they've taken some responsibility for that. So they're less likely later to come back and say, well, it wasn't any good and it didn't work. And so it's a really nice, gentle way of testing the water to see what they're going to do, to see how they're feeling about things, um, to highlight anything you can help or provide, provide further clarification for. But it's uh, gentle and non-confrontational, and it leaves that really open up to an honest, honest response. And that's what we need. And so, as we were talking about earlier as well, it's really important to measure how it's going. So about measuring our own art and evaluating our own work, um, as well as how it is for the client. So we were thinking about, um, and anyone, especially geeky people, will like kind of the idea of an Excel chart, charts. We can have our different cases in there. We can look at, um, obviously, setting up monitoring for that specific client and owner, um, asking how it would be helping the owner to monitor, because. What works for some people won't work for other people. So for me, I'm a really to-do list person. I like they do things like have lunch because then it means I'm probably going to take something off that day. Mm -hmm. um, but other people love doing it on their computers or in different ways. And so I would never say to everyone, what you need to do is do it in this app because it's amazing. I might suggest that, but everyone's going to have their own way of, of monitoring things. So you want to give the uh, focus on them and how they want to monitor it. Um, so we can set up monitoring with the client, um, make sure you've got lots embedded in there to celebrate successes, to celebrate the small wins um, so that they feel happy and can see the progress. But also we need to be thinking about our own performance, and this is something that often gets missed, is what's on your dashboard? So the dashboard is when you're driving along, luckily we don't need to understand all the workings of a car, um, we can just see those big light flashing um, because you're, something terrible is about to happen. Um, or that you need to know to keep within the speed limit and that kind of thing. 
So what's on your dashboard? What do you need to know to feel fulfilled that your uh, career and your talk um, conversations are going in the right way? So this is things that we can keep records. We can even keep records of things like, well, I use this explanation about the regression to that to these clients, and that worked really well. And then I tried this one, and it didn't work so well. So maybe I won't try that again. You can build up like a um, almost a database of what things seem to really resonate with people, what things don't resonate so well, and, and use that information. And feel free to write it down. You know, feel free to say, well, that that talk didn't go so well because everyone in the audience is about to go to sleep. Or for example, of monitoring that. Or that talk went brilliantly because people seem to really engage. And have the same thing about your own conversations. That one went really well. Um, I think I really had them and then I lost them. You know, that kind of thing. And if we really look at our kind of how this works across all, everything we do, we can get better and better and really embrace that kind of seeking the element and embrace the change of ourselves and the way we run things. And be kind to yourself um, because. Um, you're worth it, you know your, you know your job, you're all amazing, we're all superheroes in capes, um, and sometimes uh, things don't always go as well. Is it okay? So, take home messages from this section are to understand things fuller, to ask all those questions, really make sure you understand, make sure you're not just looking at one part of the elephant, but the whole situation. Don't make assumptions because um, that's never good, you might make it wrong, and there's nothing worse than having someone assume <laughs> something about you that's not true. Um, have that empathetic approach, truly involve people, address the causes, not the symptoms, use habit, um, try to instill habits in yourself and help your owners and clients um, develop, have positive habits. Think about the animal, the human animal, so we're all very forgiving when it comes to dogs, we would never just say, that's a nasty dog. Um, we would question how they got there, you know, what's their previous experience, how are they feeling, what's, uh, what kind of day have they had. <laughs> um, we would never just say they're a nasty dog. So we need to do the same with people. You know, people are, um, have had the bring their experiences to the table. And embrace the complexities, get geeky about it, start mapping things out, do your problem trees, do your theory of changes and um, really kind of understand your own role in your career and in those conversations um, because the more we embrace complexities, the more solutions and the more answers are out there and we can find them and really look at it from a bigger systems-based viewpoint. So thank you for listening, get in touch, find the book, it says, it's got my name on big letters but I really didn't do much, it's all the amazing people I asked to write it, the, the awesome ones. Um, some of which are in this room, um, after that especially. Um, so there's the book, um, we do lots of, sort of support, we do behave, um, in person work and on tra online training courses, we do bespoke training, consultancy, and we generally have a shared feeling and passion to help animals through changing human behaviour. Um, so feel free to get in touch, and I'm always happy to talk and geek out with people. One more thing before we go, before the questions is over lunch, what I'd really like to do is just do anything of the things we've covered today. So whether it's thinking about the stages of change model and how that might work in your work, whether it's about thinking about questioning or talking to each other over lunch and saying, oh, could you clarify that or tell me more about this? Um, and have it, having a play with conversations, whether it's doing a messy map, a kind of a mind map thing, whether it's coming up with a habit statement or setting goals, or the problem solution tree, um, go and have a play with some of this, and we'll come back and answer, have some questions and answers just after lunch. So thanks everybody.